She's the pushy broad from the Bronx, New York. Follow her voice, a straight dog is nice. She's the pushy broad from the Bronx, oh yeah. Don't be surprised if you want to listen twice. Make decisions, find the right choice. Know yourself better, find your own voice. It's okay if you need help today, cause everybody needs a little push. From the pushy broad from the Bronx, New York. My name is Princess. That's all spent. That your name is Princess and the rest of it? Yes. Okay. And then my husband's names, the two names together, Olufemi, Olufemi Coyote. Olufemi Coyote. Coyote. Coyote, yes. Coyote. Olufemi Coyote. Coyote. Okay. And you were born <laughs> Princess. Yeah, that's my name. That's your name. So how come your mother decided to name you princess? Interesting enough, they didn't name me princess. They actually gave me Arit, which is A-R-I-T. But somehow in the journey of my life, I, I didn't agree. The name just didn't go down so well with me because it was like my grandmother's name. And then I decided to choose a name for myself. So I chose Sarah, actually. Then I got to know that Sarah actually means little princess. That's Abraham and Sarah in the Bible. So I just decided I prefer the little princess. And I've constantly, my youth is renewed all the time. I look young. <laughs> I was 56 last month. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. That's wonderful. Thank you. So yes. tell me, what attracted you to answer my question? Oh, I looked at the question. It was like, okay, um, she would like to get women, you know? And I'm like, um, I've gone through quite a number of things in my life. Um, I'm actually going through a separation now. Of course, the only husband I married in my life. <laughs> or who married me, or where we married each other. And... Um, I've experienced a lot of different ups and downs in, 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 on, on that different extreme situations. And I just said, we, we can only win. We can, we can only win and we can only be there for one another. And nobody needs to feel out of place. You know, sometimes you think you're the only one going through something and then you stay hidden. But there are a lot of people who are probably going through the same thing or even worse. Um, I just want to be in that space. I'm actually enjoying the spaces I'm entering into now because I'm finding that, oh, there's still a lot of people there that can be motivated and lifted and I can also learn because I, I have that spirit of learning. I am a continuous, I mean, I can tell you how many classes I'm doing right now, <laughs> how many courses I'm on right now. So it's like a whole, lot of you know learning giving learning giving learning giving you know before calling you today an idea just came into my head it was like oh my god a lot of people are doing so many things on online space why am i forgetting part of what i give what is the sexual assault referral response centers of these different states in my country what are they thinking of post covid era so i said okay that's true i just put it i have a book of ideas Okay, what can we do? We can do a one-day conference. Let me see, I can call some speakers around the world and let's see what we can do. And let's give some value to how they move on with how they respond to both domestic and sexual violence. Because that is, it's, with COVID, it actually spiked. Yes, of so, course. Well, I, I see that, that, um, that you are a Nigerian criminal justice psychologist. That's what it says. Yes, I am. A prominent yes. child rights activist. And yes. become an Ashoka Fellow in 2007. Yes. Let's talk yes. about Ashoka and what it means for women all over the world. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, Ashoka is um, it's um, um, it's um, a kind of um, they're they're basically change makers. They're people who do who solve problems. They may be old problems, they may be new problems, but they solve them in a very innovative way. So how did I join in? 
my work on child sexual abuse in Nigeria when I started in 2000, because there was nobody doing anything in the country, I came in and it was a bit more dynamic. So I we started with a campaign on why nobody is talking, why the silence. We have a problem that WHO and the World Health Organization has declared a public health epidemic in 1999. And we are not saying anything in Nigeria. And I happen to be a survivor, but that wasn't the reason why I started doing that. I'm also a survivor of child sexual abuse. And so I'm like, so what is happening? And coming from my media background, I decided to do a media campaign. And with the media campaign, the cases began to come to my office. So we virtually learned on the field how to work with the police, saw the lapses, the gaps, the challenges they have, saw the lapses and the challenges the state has. I just plugged myself in there. That's how I became a criminal justice psychologist. Went back to school. Became a forensic intervene, was being built, and everybody was coming with capacity. Wow. So what is the so, organization? How does the organization... So while doing that, Ashoka work globally. Um, it was started by Bill Drayton. One of the change maker um, um, idea, idea, the, the, the one selling the idea to the world. Now, of course, you have um, you have Evergreen, you have some sort of social media, social change enterprises. But what they do is they go globally looking for people who are doing innovative and um, scalable solutions to the problems that we have. And so they found me doing what I was doing. I had established a rape crisis center model that served the entire country. We had brought in victim advocates. So we brought in a lot of models and added them together, you know, to, to reach. And then we built capacity of our social um, work um, in, in the country, as well as the police, the criminal justice um, sector. Capacity was built on how to address child sexual abuse. Our police were trained to interrogate. They don't know how to talk to victims <laughs> and they don't know how to work with children. And um, so violence was not anything they were trained on. They were trained more to deal with criminals, not with victims. So we had to build capacity, source for capacity and began to do trainings and building everybody's capacity, even communities and parents. And then we worked with the children. That was, that's the most fascinating part for me because we decided to start working with children. And then we had, um, we developed a, what you call a children advisory board. I mean, they were as low, the youngest were, were five <laughs> on the board. We had a children advisory board where they say what they want, how they want it done. And they contributed to projects that were sponsored by Global Fund for Children. And they loved that aspect of the Children Advisory Board. You should see the meetings were very interesting, where children are saying, we don't want, that's not what we want. This is how we want to prevent this problem. You know, they could, they could contribute into the, into, the, into the process. And we had two major projects where children directed those projects, how they wanted them. And they produce a lot of materials. So in the course of all of this, Ashoka was sourcing out and found that, okay, something unique is happening in Nigeria. Let's go see what that person is doing. But you have to go through about three different um, 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 how, segments in their interview. It's a very tough, <laughs> they make it tough because they want to make sure you understand what it is you're doing and that you can multiply that, 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 that process or, or system that you developed can be adapted elsewhere and then also, and also scalable. You can increase the capacity of what you're doing. And so I scaled through all the interviews. Um, they had some senior officers come down. You know, they have consultants who come to the second level and then the third level. I went through all. And then what they do for you in the first three years of your fellowship, they support you financially as an individual. In other words, they're saying, we don't want you to think about finances. We want you to put all your attention on this system you're developing this work 
to solve this problem. So for three years, Ashoka pays you kind of what you they call it a stipend, or we call it like a salary. <laughs> like you earn an income every month from them to support you doing what you're doing. And then you become a life fellow after that. So I see. 2010, yeah, you become a so, life fellow. But it's so, a very... Go ahead. Your concentration is, of course, um, on child abuse, sexual... Sexual abuse. Sexual yes. abuse. Yes. And uh, they allow you as a fellow, yes. fellow to continue your work and publish so that they have yes. evidence-based data, right? Yes. So that you do training and all of that. Yes. But coming yes. back to this, I know you've been with them now for a yes. few years, since 2007. You had said to me something yes. that we were finding as well in the mental health field, yes. and that is during this crisis, during this global crisis, the abuse cases are on the rise yes. because it's a terrorizing situation to have the abuser in the yes. house with you all the time. Yes. So tell me about what you see yes. out there and what's going on and how you're addressing it. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a very, the, 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 the phone lines have been on. <laughs> I mean, ringing all the time. And then we also have a WhatsApp account. We have a WhatsApp. So we, social media platforms are also utilized to receive messages. So the Facebook is, the messenger is active. The, the BOT is active, the bot is active. The Instagram account is active. Twitter is active. And WhatsApp is very active, apart from phone calls. Calls are coming in and what we're doing. And that, I think that was what brought up the idea I had, that I shared with you earlier, the sexual violence response team. So it, it state my country has. Lagos started it. And um, so there's a state sexual and domestic and sexual violence response team and so we capitalize on that team when cases happen and particularly during this covid it's been more active in the sense that they have certain capacities that individual organizations don't have they have state resources available because there's a lockdown so you can't even even call the police to say oh could you please go show up somewhere there's a problem Nobody wants to meet anybody one-on-one -on -one <laughs> because of COVID. And so what has been happening has been mainly the use of phone calls. I still, not long ago, I was still talking to the director because another girl called, there are many calls coming in. And so what we're using is, so once, once the state now puts a call through to a perpetrator, that helps a bit to say, if we hear anything happen to her again, because if, if there's a call from anywhere that anything is happening here again, we'll come and pick you out, we'll come and take you out. So that has helped in some way. The might of the states has helped somehow in saving some women, but that is like saying save some. Save some. It's not effective, in, but clearly the one where you receive a call that it's happening right now and the woman is at death point. So those ones, the tax force has to go in and break down the door and get the woman out. Oh my goodness. I understand what that's like. So yeah. you have been able to build that organization mm -hmm. through uh, Ashoka, correct? Mm -hmm. And name that organ, T talk about that hotline again, the name of the hotline for everybody to know. Okay, the hotlines are basically, are basically our own hotline. That's media corn hotline yeah. now. I didn't develop that organization. It's a state organization where a collaboration of everybody who is working in the field of domestic and sexual violence. So there is a state's response team that every organization is a part of. So I could call the state's response team to say, okay, fine. We just got a call from so-and-so and give the details there needs to be intervention. And so the state calls. So a call will go from the state's response team. It's called the Domestic and Sexual Violence Response Team, DSVRT. And that now, is the response team that takes that, that, that handles all of Lagos or all of Nigeria? All of Lagos. All of Lagos. All of Lagos. Yes. But this is a, a very innovative idea that should spread around to other countries and other states and other cities actually so, yes 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 a few states yeah 
a few states have already started. A few states have started. You have um, like about six states out of the 36, apart from Lagos, have initiated their own response team. It's actually, it's a, it's a growing, it's a, it's a fast movement that states are beginning to love the idea that Lagos is doing and taking, Lagos has always been the, has always been the pioneer state of most movements of, great movements of things happening. It starts in Lagos. <laughs> it starts okay. in well, Lagos. And then it goes up, up, no. I think it started. Yes. <laughs> I think it started. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's the, the, the that, that particular team has actually been, so we all come in and you know, we, we, we have a WhatsApp group where we share what is going on. When people come in and say, see, this is happening. And then we, we intervene, those who have capacity to intervene, like if it's going to be counseling, if it's going to be um, therapy. So you have professionals who are in there who will take off matters at their different capacities. But everything is being done online for now. So everybody is taking advantage of the digital space. And that's a wonderful thing. So getting back yeah. to our original question, I mean, you were saying so many wonderful things, but what do you want to people, what do you want people to know about being in quarantine and dealing with relationships? How did this affect you? What do you want our audience to know about that? First of all, one of the things that um, this has done is give time for introspect. That is really looking at how unprepared we are. COVID met us unprepared. The whole world. But, 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 but you know, what we call developed nations and on I mean, developing nations. Everybody is at a loss. Now, not only because of, um, of looking for a vaccine, but in terms of the crisis response, it shows a lot of gaps. We were not prepared. Okay, now we're told to stay home. Even schools who are abroad find that nobody was prepared for online learning, except for, of course, higher institutions who have been doing that, who have been doing distant learning, you know, who already have that framework. So even schools are not prepared for it. Families are not prepared financially. A lot of families, at least, there are families who will say, okay, we are well off, we can take care of our needs. But when we want to look at the percentage, we're talking about if, from my own personal estimate now, this is not in research or scientific, could say 10% are ready and 90% were not. And that's a lot of people. So, and then also, and it also creates an opportunity for tension. Children are not used to being indoor. Parents are not used to be in, being indoor, except for a few entrepreneurs who already run their businesses, who are used to staying at home. But they stay at home, they don't have their spouses stay at home with them. And they don't have the children stay at home with them all day. So you have a lot of conflicts happening within families. Those who were a single before, like a single person who was living before, the loneliness was loud because before you could still go to work or step out and then come home to know, okay, within six, seven hours, I'll be alone, but I'm going to be back out there, you know, with the world again. But so now I'm here, I'm stuck. It's just me. So you have a lot of depression issues. You have a lot of domestic violence, even for perpetrators who were never perpetrators. They became perpetrators because of COVID. People begin to take it out on their children. The children don't know what to do with them. And um, we'll be, we, we're having a webinar very soon, I think by the end of May, where we are talking to parents on sexually inappropriate behavior of children. Parents are not looking into that. And people are in denial. Because now you can see your children, so you could actually stumble on your child in the masturbating or you know, self-pleasuring or whatever. And now you can see that your child, your, your child probably is behaving inappropriately with their siblings. A lot of things, a lot of things are happening. But a lot of good things are also happening. It's not all bad. What are the it's good things that are happening? The good things, things, yes. The good things are, yeah, the, well, the good things are people are, are, are reviewing their relationship in terms of 
you know, oh, these are the gaps we have. So how do we get it better? If we're going to be hanging around each other for long enough and we want to keep this going, we've got to make it work. So what's going to work for you is going to work for me. Let's get this thing. So we are, we're also receiving people who are asking for counseling and help in, that, in those areas to say, we want to make our relationship work. And so we discovered that, oh, being at home has opened us a lot of gaps you know, in our, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our sex life, in our romance life, in our relationship, in our communication, even with our children. Oh, now my children are teens. I'm really just seeing my children. I thought I knew them. I don't know them. And I want to know my children. I want, I want, I want this to be better. So you're finding a lot. A lot of people are, I've encouraged people to write their books. A lot of people are writing e-books. I have about um, 50 people I've worked with who are developing, who are writing their books. So a lot of good things are also happening. So people are taking advantage of the time to develop themselves. You know, self-developments are happening for people. The yeah. universities, even the high level ones like Harvard, have opened up their, you know, their distant learning for even free classes and free courses. So you're having a lot of materials out there. You're seeing a lot of women groups, like we met on the women groups. You're seeing people, I just got into women groups, you know? I just got into, come on, search for them find people, network, meet people. So a lot of opportunities are opening up for, for connection, global connections that now borderlessness is really real. You know, before we thought, okay, yes, oh, we used to say, you know, you know the, net, the internet um, makes the world a small place, but it is more real to us now. <laughs> it's real to us now that, oh, it's really a small place. Like we're connecting. You know, at this time, it's morning back home for you and it's going to evening for me. But yeah, we are talking. So it's, it's, so there, there are good things happening. As much as we know that some bad things are happening in the world, there are a lot of good things that are happening. Solutions are being butted. People are cracking their heads on how to solve hard situations. How can we work better? What can we do better? What can you birth? What new things can you birth? What are the things that we, you know, so there are good things happening for people. Yes, there are many good things. And I am so glad that you said that because we are able to make the connection. And the, the idea is to try to go to the positive way and to understand that we can reach out more and we're comfortable with that reach. Yes. And also understand that it is not only the biggest problem with the virus is not only getting the virus and feel it and, and, and having all of the other stuff go on, but the mental distress and the mental anxiety yeah. and the personal development that someone has to go through. I've been doing many episodes on how we are trying to rise to the occasion of discovering ourselves for the first yes, time. Yes because we are in this isolation situation where we have begun for the first time to be introspective, really introspective. Yes. And that we are it, yes. dealing with ourselves and we are working on ourselves for the first time, maybe for some of us ever in this way. Ever, yeah, first time ever, I mean, <laughs> ever. Yeah, ever. We've heard about pandemics, but we've never experienced it. <laughs> we've heard about the famines in the Bible, the famines, oh, there was no food, the whole world was shut down, there was no rain. No, it's never really been something we have. Something so tiny, so invisible. It's just putting the whole, I mean, bringing the whole world. I mean, the whole world knows its name. I mean, the whole world. It's yeah. absolutely amazing. Um, I wanted to... Uh, exactly so the whole world is feeling it everywhere. There's, there's no place. There's no place to hide. Yeah, there's no place right? to hide. No place, no place to hide. And that's no because it is global. And for the first time in our existence, we're able to reach every part of the globe. If something yes. was happening before and major things were happening, the whole world didn't know about it. And it didn't react. The whole world, you know, wasn't yes. a part of it. This is that this, there is no place on this earth yes. that this virus has not touched. I've not gotten to, <laughs> there's no place, there's no place, there's right. no place. So first of all, tell us what's going on in, in, in Nigeria. Are you still at stay at home directives and, and, and what's happening with testing and stuff? What's happening in Lagos specifically and in Nigeria? Whoa, Nigeria. Oh, 
great things. Okay, first of all, the, the initial lock, lockdown was for three, two states and the federal capital. Lagos, Ogun State, and then the federal capital where the president uh, resides. And then, um, so four weeks lockdown ended last week, no, five weeks lockdown ended last week. The president announced last week that they should start e easing lockdown. People are saying no, yes. But the president has spoken. And then the state government now said, okay, fine. The few offices that would open should open between nine and three. Some of the banks will open, some essential services will open, but still encourage people that can work from home. While the state's um, civil service says everybody from grade, the low grades to grade 11 should not come to work. So only the top level civil, civil servants can come to work because I mean, they have their cars, they can drive in their own personal cars and come to work. But yesterday was a disaster, a what? major disaster. Why? Because it didn't look like there was any lockdown. As at 6.30 a.m., the bridges were blocked, were unlocked, were on, you know, bumper to bumper cars. The banks faced um, pandemonium. People were jumping the fence because they wanted to get money, uh, you know, and because people have maybe a lot of um, service issues. Maybe their ATM is, got stuck or that, you know, and so people bombarded the banks. I mean, the whole place was like a riot. And then we're saying, we've said this. We are scared right now because we don't know what infections, you know, are happening because people were not, there was no social distancing. People, I mean, people were jumping on each other. They were wearing face masks, but they were crowded, they were riots at banks yesterday. Other people are saying it may ease down because that was probably the first day. I don't know how today is. I've not even gone on news to check all the days that my daughter had to go to work today. She's one of my daughters, had to go to work. And I was like, oh, tell now you can drop that job. You can drop that job. We can't afford, you know, you have a baby. We can't afford <laughs> anything bad happening to you. Okay, fine. You are taking all the precautions, but you're still going to get to work and be exposed to other people who are probably taking not as much, you know, care because they don't have that because she said she, she she told me today that she actually asked the cleaner how she got to work and that was said the buses are still carrying full capacity they were told to do 60 percent but they're still doing a hundred percent because the state gave you know the state government gave particular instructions on how movement should go because it's an ease it's not a full you know freedom for everybody to go out it's an ease so for buses who are, who are working do 60% capacity, have your hand wash, have the water and soap people to use as they go in, um, clean the buses once people go out, you know, do so a lot of things, but I'm not sure that is happening. And so we are scared. Actually, we are scared. We are scared because we don't know what results. Because Ghana that tried, Ghana that has even done more testing than us. I mean, they've, they've, they've been really advanced than even Nigeria in response. Decided to do an is on the first day of East, they had 241 infections. So we are scared. Right now, there are no, we are scared. I understand. And we're scared too. We're trying to ease out. I'm over here on the East Coast of the United States where the biggest infections are, New York and New Jersey. I'm sure you've heard all about it. It's yes you know, where we're just exploding with cases and everybody else wants to go right back out there and our governors are saying, we can't do that. I mean, no. like packed people all over the place and people just want to explode out there. And, and right now we're experiencing spring and then summer and people want to go out to the beaches and do all of those things and it's a very scary situation and we're almost certain that it's going to see a second and a third wave it has to it has to, it has to come back so in terms of I, I wanted to to come back a little bit to 
tell me what you are talking to your clients about during this time and, and especially where is your work devoted on a mental health level? What kind of message do you want to leave with us in terms of what we should be doing and how we can continue to foster good mental health practices during this? Okay, um, one of the things um, I recommend now is also breathing. Breathing is one of the things. When you find yourself, you know, sometimes like an anxiety attack, you just, over it's so easy to just take a deep breath and exhale through your mouth slowly. It sort of stabilizes the mind. Interesting enough, it's the mind that is being attacked because everything is from the mind. Well, with activities for mothers who have to do much more and they're still entrepreneurs or they're still doing their office work at home and, and then they have to take care of the family, they have to meet and those who are taking care of toddlers. And there's a lot of activity and the dads are just gradually getting to the helping them kind of. <laughs> so, or that is also working and you, everybody comes to the mind. Mom, I mean, mom too is even than the men. The men are more like um, are having job issues. When where is the next? You know, the money coming. Where, where's the next money coming from? I mean, I mean, lose my job. Already in Nigeria, they're already announcing a bank announced that is going to drop seventy percent of staff before December, and people are screaming that you could give one billion naira to support COVID for the states. Why would you give one billion to the state and now want to sack 70% of your staff and you're already telling them ahead? Once people just go and commit suicide, people will start committing, you know, things. So the best thing is inhale. Now we can't take a walk. Not everybody can take a walk. If you don't have a compound where you can do that or an estate, you can do that. So you, you take a breath in, find some music that you enjoy or just close your eyes. I tell people daydreaming is actually one of the best. Close your eyes and go to that place where somewhere in your past where you had fun, you were happy, it could be the beach, and then you try to visual senses, your smell and everything to capture all those incidents and just relax. And there's that issue of no matter what is happening in the home, have a me time. Have a me time. A me time means for oh, that five minutes, hey, it is your time. Nobody else. If you feel like jumping, you know, and dancing and shaking yourself and just laughing or go to a comedy, you know, um, they, I have a lot of them on Instagram that I go to. I just laugh myself out. It's helpful. Dance while going to the kitchen. Turn activities to fun. If you have children, it becomes intentional. You have to now be intentional about it. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> yeah. Find something that makes you happy and do it. Maybe daily. That's wonderful. Find something that makes you happy. Do things deliberately. Okay. Hands all over the house. I heard that. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So I'm immediately going to do that. I'm thrilled. So I want you to leave us maybe with one last word about your message to the world here, because we're gonna we're gonna uh, you have to. Down. So so, yes. so Krista. <laughs> Give us your message to the world today, please. So Pushy Broad from the Bronx can broadcast it everywhere. Let's hear what you have to say. Go ahead. Okay. 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 What I have to say is this too will pass. It will pass. What we're seeing today will pass. And it's just making sure that we position ourselves right for the post era because there is, this is a game changer. Things are no longer be the same way we used to do. So we've got to check ourselves. Am I going to be, we have got to make ourselves more compliant with the post era to make sure that we are positioned to have a life. So that's my word. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you.
Welcome Transformational Talk Radio listeners. My name is Ellen Stewart and I am the pushy broad from the Bronx. This is my podcast, Everybody Needs a Little Push, and I'm very excited to bring today a special guest. I sent a massive message out to certain groups that I belong to, as well as my Pushy Broad from the Bronx fan page, and I asked listeners out there to respond to me in terms of how they felt about staying at home and taking care of themselves in isolation, and if there was any dangerous situations they were in at that time, and how they could get themselves safe. So I got tremendous responses from quite a few people. One in particular is a transformation coach and an author who is a survivor of domestic violence. And she has something very interesting to share with us today. Her name is Chantelle Cox. And let me tell you just a little bit more about her. She rebuilt herself after leaving an abusive husband. And she really had a personal transformation, so she wrote a book about it called Create a Life You Love. And from there, sprang a podcast on podcast stations everywhere. Please listen to her podcast. The Create a Life You Love podcast is out now. And she is using her story to empower women on their journeys of recovery. Please welcome my guest, Chantelle Cox. Hey, Chantel, how are you? Hi, I'm fabulous. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Tell me about this amazing book, The Create a Life You Love. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so a few years after my divorce, the everyone around me, my immediate friends and family just started noting, like, you have so much more confidence. You are so much more at peace. Um, we've just watched you transform before our eyes. What did you do? And how do I do it? You know, <laughs> type of thing. How do I get some of that? And so I'm a teacher by trade. And so I just started kind of compiling and reflecting on, well, what, what have I done? And basically, prior to my marriage, I had had no real self-help. I never dove into that kind of world. And so after it, I clearly did not like where my life was and was kind of, you know, hit my rock bottom and didn't really know how to get out of there. So I just started reading books and listening to audiobooks and listening to podcasts and then started implementing the things that all the gurus were telling me to do. And then, Who were your greatest inspirations? Um, I remember kind of breaking down at one point um, with Brene Brown, and then um, Byron Katie was a big one. Um, that loving what is was just, yeah, that is a it's a tough read if you are struggling <laughs> with something because you don't want to love what is, you want to play the victim and you know, believe your truths, the whole firm in your truths, which aren't true. <laughs> so. I understand you have to, you, you're so torn down. Um, we were talking before the broadcast uh, and, and I was mentioning that some of the clients that I work with were also victims of domestic violence because they were trying to escape active alcoholics and addicts. Um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about your abusive situation, if it would be okay for you to do that. Yeah. If, can you tell me how long ago this was, first of all? Um, I left on my 30th birthday, and I turned 36 next month, so six years ago. And how long were you in that situation? Not long, fortunately. Uh, we had met online and had a long-distance relationship. He lived about two hours uh, south of where I live, and uh, he was in the Air Force. And so through our courtship, we not only had the long distance of you know, two hours away, we had, we went through a couple deployments and he was able to really kind of hide some of his um, anger issues and whatnot. And I had a very false sense of intimacy and in knowing him. It was not what I thought it was. <laughs> when did you first start to see the signs of this kind of abuse? I did not notice it until I had already moved down there and we were engaged. Down where? And, um, down to Oklahoma City. I see. 
And so I had already left my job and my support system from up here and moved down there where I knew no one. It was very isolated. Um, and then things started kind of increasing, but reflecting back on it, there was a lot of manipulation prior that I just wasn't savvy enough to pick up on. Uh, All right, and, a second. Give me an example of that. One example of that mm -hmm. manipulation um, that you weren't immediately aware of. Yeah. Um, so my friends and I, one day we went to, this is while he was deployed and we were pretty recent dating and my friends and I went to a winery and just had a fun, beautiful summer day enjoying a local winery and doing a wine tasting. And we had a designated driver. We're all 21. Like it's just a very innocent, fun girls day. And so I'd sent him some pictures um, and he said later while we were on Skype, he's like, yeah, I was showing my buddy these pictures. And I was like, isn't that cool? It doesn't, it look like her and her friends have so much fun. And then he said, um, I guess if you want to be dating an alcoholic, and then he just kind of chuckled. He's like, isn't that funny? And I'm like, I went to a winery with friends for one day. Like, how, how does that make me an alcoholic? What are you talking about? Um, and so it struck me as odd, but he played it off so smoothly that I didn't even really question it or pick up on it. But I did start when my friends would say, hey, let's go dancing, let's go karaoke, I would be worried about, well, is he going to think this or say that? And so I started kind of changing some of my life things. Okay. And then when did it become more serious and how? Um, once I had moved down there and then he returned from a deployment. And so now we're dealing with that and our wedding was in like two weeks. So dealing with the stresses of a wedding, um, figuring each other out, just living together for the first time. Um, and I can't even remember what I said, but we had gotten into kind of a heated discussion and I'm pretty non-confrontational. And so I was just like, you know what? this this isn't going anywhere good i'm gonna go take a shower and um just breathe and then let's discuss this calmly in like 30 minutes and so i removed myself from the situation and he'd never been physical before i had no reason to suspect he would ever be and then while i was in the shower he came in and like attacked me and threw me when up against the wall okay threw you and, up against the wall and and just um was yelling in my face, saying really mean, hurtful things, um, just how, how lucky I was to be with him and how worthless I'd be without him. And um, just all, all the normal textbook things that now when I see it on TV shows, uh, you know, it's kind of like, a, oh, this was so textbook. How did I not see it? But when you're in it, you, it, it just happens. And that's, yes. It just happens. And also, I am sure that even right after you were, you found a way to rationalize it away. This is I a one-time thing, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe I did something to deserve it. Maybe I'll, you know, uh, maybe I'll be better next time. Or maybe he was just upset about something and he took it out on me. And I am sure this will never happen again. Exactly. Right? And then and that's kind of, even leading now, just reflecting just now in our conversation, I laid out all the, all the reasons why, you know, the, there was all this stress and there's this and there's that. And those were my rationalizations as to why it happened and that it would be a one-time thing. And, and then what was, just, just give us an idea of the progression of how bad it got and how long you were there and how you left. Yeah. So I, we were only legally married for seven months when I filed for divorce and left him. Um, so it progressed fairly quickly <laughs> um, to the point where he was telling me things like if it did get physical and I'd be like, I, you know, we can't do this. We've got to go to therapy. We've got to do this. Um, 
he'd say, you think this is bad? And he would explain to me the terrible things that he did to his first wife oh. and say, that's where we're heading if you, if you don't shape up, basically. Um, so kind of threatening me with that. And the things he told me, I mean, were frightening. Like, I, I'm not sure how she survived them. I understand. And you had no inkling before of the first mm -hmm. wife in any shape, manner, or form. That wife never reached out to you, nothing like that. You were completely yeah. in the dark. Correct. I knew she existed. They had a three-year-old son together. So, I mean, I had met her um, while picking up uh, my stepson and things like that. But no, we, he definitely manipulated both of us and played us against each other um, as to where he portrayed her as unstable, alcoholic, unfit mother. He had full custody. Um, and so she just saw him every other weekend. And so that's the picture. So I never really reached out to her. Um, after I left, she sent me an email um, and I just thanked her, uh, but then we never continued contact. I understand. So gratefully, first of all, congratulations on understanding that you could not be a victim. That's mm -hmm. the first thing. And also congratulations on understanding the difference between good mental health behavior and mm -hmm. bad mental health behavior. And understanding that you did not have to put up with it and that you had mm -hmm. choices. And those things are extremely valuable experiences. So let me ask you something. Was he an active alcoholic or an addict at all? Did he show any of those signs? He did not. Um, when I was really pushing to go to therapy, um, he was like, why would I go to therapy? I'm smarter than any therapist. Actually, I'm going to go get my master's in therapy. <laughs> and he started um, researching what it would take to do that. And then he was looking up personality disorders. And at one point he called me over to his computer and he's like, will you read this? And it was the definition of a narcissist, which I was not familiar with at that time and as i read it i just remember freezing because i'm like i don't know how he wants me to respond and if i don't respond the way he wants me to respond it's not going to be pretty and what happened i read it and it was him to a t and then i just said i don't know do you think it sounds like you and then he just kind of laughed it off and he's like, oh, I don't know, whatever. And then we moved on and I was like, oh gosh, <laughs> like didn't know where that was going. Um, okay. So when you were making plans to get out, did someone help you? I had no plans. You had it no plans. Very, um, so I had two friends come visit me for my 30th birthday and he had been very un unkind and hurtful uh, in conversations the night before and the morning of, and then he had gone to work and I had shared with my best friend who happens to be a social worker. Uh, I shared with her some of the things. And so the next morning he had left for work and she said, I can't leave you here. And I said, I know. And then I just started running through my head of, okay, I need to get, up in the attic to get my cat carrier so I can safely transport her with us. And I need to get the marriage license and I need my passport and I, you know, all the logistical things. And then we, it was two friends who had driven down in one car together. So she drove her car back and the other friend drove my, me and my car back. And we just loaded up as much as we could fit in those two cars. And I called my parents and my sister and then we and met, you left and I left. And yes. I, I thought at that time that it was just a separation, that we'd get help and it would help our relationship grow stronger. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my dad is very, very religious. And I was, I think, afraid to get divorced, afraid to disappoint him. And so when he heard the stories and then said, do you think this is salvageable? And I said, I, I don't know what that means. And he said, I think if you ever go back to him, the next time I see you will be in a body bag. And I said, what do I do? Wake up call. Yeah. And he said, lawyer up. And I'm like, 
it's my 30th birthday. I don't know how to lawyer up. What do I do? <laughs> like, what does that mean? And it was a graduation was, out of adolescence and young adulthood, <laughs> wasn't it? It's a big graduation. Absolutely. I get it. But you had yep. people in your corner and, and those two girls that were supporting you, I'm sure they have helped to save your life in many ways. And whether it is physical abuse or mental abuse, it is extremely damaging. There's no question. It is always a matter of life and death. So then a little bit later, you had decided to write this book, Create the Life You Love. I'd like you to tell us a little bit about it. Give us an idea of some of the most important pieces of it so uh, we, can, we know where to find it. Okay. Absolutely. So it is available on Amazon and both PDF and paperback version. And it has 10 chapters. And so it's 10 healthy habits to transform your life now. And they're the 10 habits that I personally used to transform my life. None of them are brand new habits that I invented. These are well-known, well-used uh, habits like uh, practicing affirmations and having a gratitude journal and things like that. And so the first part of every chapter is kind of my story with that. And I kind of was a self-help um, skeptic <laughs> prior to all this. And I'm like affirmations like that Stuart Smalley guy on Saturday Night Live. Why would I do that? That sounds ridiculous. And then trying it and then the transformation that I had with it. And then the second part of the chapter, like I said, I'm a teacher. <laughs> so the second part of every chapter is called Your Turn. And then it sets out um, steps that anybody can implement that practice in their own life and have their own transformation. Wonderful. Really wonderful. And what kinds of things happen on your podcast? So I just started it. I'm calling it my COVID baby. <laughs> It's something that I talked about for a year. And then finally, when the world stopped and my evenings and weekends were not full with social activities, um, I finally just figured out how to do it and took the time to invest in that. And so I mostly connect with people just like this via Zoom and we stream it onto Facebook. And then I take the audio and put it on my podcast and they share tips of how they are creating a life that they love and just really uplifting, empowering messages. And I started with a series, uh, COVID related called Thrive Not Survive, where we specifically talked about how people are thriving during a turbulent time instead of just barely hanging on and surviving. I completely understand, <laughs> which is which is something that is so pertinent to all of us today, no question. So what are the, some of the major warning signs you would point out to someone who is possibly living in this very threatening situation right now? Give me, give us just a few little tips as to what to look for and also some major suggestions for that person to get to some safe, safety. Absolutely. Uh, when I look back and reflect on our courtship leading up to it, it really... I kept saying like, it's like a dream. It's too good to be true. He's so perfect. And so I think that's a warning sign. If you're starting to date someone and it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, there's probably that's something- interesting observation there. If it's too good to be true, it's really not Prince Charming. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> so okay. cause even, you know, right now I'm in a very healthy, loving relationship, but it's not perfect. I would not describe it as too good to be true. You know, it's, it's very good, uh, but it's not perfect. And the other one was like just movie picture. Perfect. It wasn't reality. And so then notice the small things because every time I had something in my gut that was like, well, that's kind of odd, but I didn't listen because I didn't want to give up the fantasy that I was believing was true. So notice the warning signs, listen to your gut for sure. And then I would probably suggest just like you find a support system, either your family or friends, and they don't initially have to believe you. They don't, that's not what this is about. They don't have to believe you. They just have to help you. 
They can believe you later or not at all, but they just have to help you find a way out of it until you can get to some safety. Would you say that was true? A hundred percent. I always say it's by the grace of God and my support system that I was able to get out and stay out. Uh, without that, I, I don't know where I'd be right now. Probably not alive. <laughs> Well, it sounds like you are thriving. It, it, it seems very wonderful. I mean, your book sounds very exciting. Please tell our listeners again who you are, where they can find you, where they can find your book, and where they can find your podcast. Absolutely. So my book, Create a Life You Love, is on Amazon. And my name is Chantel Cox. And my website is createalifeyoulovecoaching.com. And then I'm on Facebook and Instagram as create a life you love coaching. And that is the name of my, my company and my coaching program. So now you've become a transforma transformational coach. Mm -hmm. And what kind of clients do you see? Uh, primarily women. And it's typically women that are going through some type of life change. Um, it could be you know, they're recently divorced or they're thinking about divorce and they want to build up that confidence and have help kind of creating that plan. Uh, and then I get a lot of empty nesters <laughs> where they're like, my whole life has been about my kids and now they're gone and I'm trying to figure out who I am. And so that, that those big life transitions of divorce or yeah, just when they're trying to figure out their whole world has been about everyone but them. And now for the first time, they're like, who am I and what is it that I want? The reinvention of life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Good for you. What do you want to leave our listeners with today? My biggest, my favorite chapter <laughs> is about busting out of your comfort zone. And truth truly happens outside of your comfort zone, uh, gr growth does. <laughs> um, growth happens outside of your comfort zone. And it's just amazing. The changes that I've been through and the changes that my clients have been through when you do get out of that comfort zone, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be pretty. Um, for example, right now I'm trying to get back in shape. And so I started back up my couch to 5k app when I'm out there running, it's not perfect. It's not pretty. It's not fast, but I'm out there doing it. So pick what it is that you want to work on. Forget about trying to be perfect and just do it. Okay. Chantel Cox with create a life you love. Go get it on Amazon. Chantel, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Lots of good luck. Stay safe and healthy. Awesome. Thank you. This is Ellen Stewart, the Pushy Broad from the Bronx, saying thanks for listening. And remember, everybody needs a little push. From the Pushy Broad from the Bronx, New York.